Chats. My name is Nick Cook. I'm the coordinator of Friends of Lake Claremont. Thank you all for your attendance. It's almost a full house tonight. Um, Kit is a regular uh, friend of the f Friends of Lake Claremont and a regular guest of ours. Um, we're very happy to have you here tonight. It's also the first time I can introduce Kit as Dr. Kit Prendergast. <laughs> Um, tonight's talk is possibly a little controversial, um, but rather timely, I think. Uh, two weeks ago, we had volunteers down in the parks, and uh, one of our weeding volunteers pretty much almost put his hand into a um, beehive in a fallen log. And um, so I sent an email to the town of Claremont on Monday morning, and by Tuesday morning that beehive had been removed and rehomed. The town's policy, yes, yes, the town's policy is that a beehive, if it can be rehomed, will be rehomed. If it can't be rehomed, it will be exterminated. Um, last year we did an audit of the remnant bush at Lake Claremont, and we found seven feral <coughs> beehives all at once. And um, that was a result of previous policy by the town, which was that if a beehive, a feral beehive, is in the bush, and if it's near a pedestrian walkway, it will be dealt with, and if it's not, we'll forget about it. And so the accumulated effect of that policy was that we had seven feral hives in the bush, um, and our kid will uh, expand on the. Uh, Eagles of uh, <laughs> honeybees in the bush, but basically they take nesting hollows, um, and uh, there's certainly some issues around the competition with native bees, which is a point of kids for tonight. So, um, without blowing the whole talk, I'll sit down and uh, hand over to Dr. Kit. Thank you. Thanks, Kit. Thanks for the great intro, Nick. Um, and sorry for being uh, fashionably late, but I do have my bee fashion on, as you'll see. Um, but my, my actual excuse was um, traffic. I forgot that people come home from work at 5 o'clock um, rather than stay in the lab until 10 p.m. <laughs> so um, I will be talking to you about honeybees, and uh, this is a bit of a controversial issue and also one that really needs to be addressed because I'm sure if you um, read the media or Facebook posts or anything, like honeybees are declining and we're in a bee apocalypse, which is actually not true. It's quite, quite the opposite. Um, and I studied uh, the interactions between honeybees and native bees specifically as part of my PhD research here in the Southwest Western Australian Biodiversity Hotspot which is a really special place for native bees. We didn't know that it actually was so special here in the urbanised region, but I did surveys here and I've been doing some surveys as well in local bushlands over the last couple of years, including Lake Claremont. And at Lake Claremont, we have only over 40 species of bees. And that's just based on, um, I think it was three months of surveys in one year. So um, definitely more than that. Um, but overall in this region, um, the urbanised region, we'd probably have about 300 species in total. And I'm still finding species that I haven't found before. So it's a really um, biodiverse place, but we need to protect these native bees. And protecting them um, doesn't involve protecting honeybees. So let's start off with what honeybees are. Um, this is the bee that we usually see. It's the one that's always represented in the media when they have a, a bee, it's the yellow and black striped animal, not that they're really yellow and black. Um, and you probably notice the feralized ones, they're very dark, so they almost look all black. Um, the domestic ones are more of that goldy color with the brown stripes. Now, they have very different biologies and ecologies to our native bees. So they live in big perennial eusocial colonies. So this means that they're active the whole year. Um, and they've got an advanced form of sociality called eusociality. It's actually really interesting from like a, a biological point of view. So they've got a queen and she's the only one that can reproduce. She stays in the hive except for her mating flight. 
um, or when they're swarming. And then all her offspring um, that are females, they're workers and they can't reproduce. And they have different roles in the hive depending on how old they are. Um, but they, they care for their siblings, they're involved in hive maintenance, they defend the colony and of course they forage for food. Now the drones, they are the male bees and they can only do one thing in life and that's have sex and they can't do anything else because when they have sex, their penis, I coined that term, um, <laughs> their penis uh, explodes <laughs> and um, blows off and then they die. Um, but you know, if you're gonna die, I guess that's an okay way to die, right? Like, die happy. Um, <laughs> uh, but these are an introduced species though, uh, which is not so great for the wider environment. Now they were introduced into Australia the 1820s, um, Southwest Western Australia the 1840s, and they occur in both managed colonies um, by, by beekeepers. And then when they swarm, sometimes um, they establish in the wild and they become feral. And so like feral cats, and they're similarly not so great for the environment um, because they take up hollows in trees. And these hollows are so important for our native parrots and possums to nest in. Mm -hmm. um, they also compete with other honeybees, so they're not great for beekeepers. Um, native bees, other nectivorous animals like um, some parrots, the honey eaters, and our honey possums here in southwest Western Australia. Now, not all bees make honey. Actually, most bees don't make honey. So from an economic perspective, they are very important because they make a lot of honey. We have 11 species of native bees in Australia, the Melipanini in two genera, Ostroplebia and Tetragonula. They make honey, but only small amounts. It would never service the needs of um, the honey industry. And in addition, um, the honey isn't for everyone. It's at the moment not even allowed to be called legislatively honey because it's got a much higher moisture content. Um, and that's not, you know, everyone's jam or honey. Um, and uh, these, these stingless bees, they're stingless, which is great. Um, either f even the females don't have stings. Um, they don't occur in southwest Western Australia, so uh, they also don't occur in Tasmania and Victoria and South Australia. So they're distributed across the north down the east coast. Um, and they, they just can't service the, the honey industry needs. Now, our honey industry was worth a lot in hive products, so honey, but also wax. But what they're worth a lot in at the moment in industry is pollination services. And this is because they've been managed for a very long time. Humans have had a very long uh, relationship with honeybees and they are super general species. So they can visit many, many different species, including crop species that are exotic. And because they're managed, and they're very versatile, they can exist in landscapes that actually aren't so great for bees and biodiversity. So they're worth a lot in pollination services. And here in Western Australia, uh, we've got a really thriving um, honeybee industry because um, we occur in a biodiversity hotspot and we have some great honey producing flora like the Jarrah and the Mary and um, Banksias and Blackbutt. So some um, really uh, great honeys. But we also have our native bees here. Now, they're very different from honeybees, so they're mainly solitary. Uh, they don't live in colonies. The females don't care for their offspring. There's no queen and workers. Every female is both a queen and a worker. And if you're a male bee, it's so much better because you don't die when you mate. You can mate again, retain your penis. Yay. Um, now we do have some semi-social bees. These are the Elodipenes, such as Exenura. These are sometimes called reed bees. They occur in pithy stems um, and they have a semi-social structure. So they, 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 the females will live together in about two to 12, um, but they don't have that advanced form of sociality. Now, most of our bees are much smaller than honeybees. The Euroglossinae is the most species rich subfamily of bees in Australia with about 800 species. And some of these are the smallest in the world. They're just over two millimeters long. So really tiny. 
Um, this one here is Yuri Glossina Malia. It's about three millimeters long, so very tiny. Uh, we do have some larger bees like Megachili Monstrosa um, and Amygilla, which is about the size of a honeybee. And this is in southwest Western Australia. We've got some even bigger bees up north. Uh, lots of our bees are specialists. So if you read the native bee um, report that I did for Lake Claremont, lots of native bees are only found on a very limited range of flora. So those Euroglossines, almost all of them only forage on metaceae such as the eucalypts. Um, and we've also got specialists such as the Trichocolletes bees. So this one is a Trichocolletes and they specialize on the native Fabaceae. So he's on a Dabesia. Um, and the mega chili, lots of the mega chili at Lake Claremont specialize on the Jacksonia. So very specialized, um, unlike the honeybees that are generalists. Now, we can expect that honeybees might have negative impacts on native bees. Now, they could compete with them through physical competition, um, so basically battling with other bees, fighting over flowers. I haven't observed much of this in the literature. The literature there hasn't been many observations of this. Um, but the main way that they can harm native bees is through resource competition. So resource competition occurs when two or more species, they have the same flower preferences or food preferences, um, and that resource is in short supply. So there's not enough to sustain populations of both species and the superior competitor will exclude the other um, species from that foraging resource um, and they're better at foraging at that resource and we can expect honeybees would be better at foraging that resource because they live in that eusocial structure. They have a very advanced, amazing form of communication. So you've probably heard about the honeybee waggle dance. They can communicate to other members in their um, colony the direction and distance of a great patch of flowers and recruit other bees to that. Um, so very very intelligent um, species, um, but very effective at foraging. Um, and they're relatively large bees, so they need quite a lot of resources and they live in large colonies, you know, hundreds of thousands of individuals. So that takes a lot of the, the nectar and pollen supplies. And so they could um, reduce these resources to such an extent that there's not enough for our native bees and poor little native bee will die. Um, and basically when there's, there's fewer resources, they can't produce as many offspring, um, so populations decline, um, and then you know, we go into an extinction vortex. And they can also impact po pollination networks. So pollination networks are the interactions between bees and flowers. They can alter the structure of these networks, um, alter pollination, um, alter the, the interactions that occur in nature. So I tested this because as I mentioned, um, it's a very controversial topic. Many people have opinions about it, but um, there's actually very little hard evidence. So just yesterday I submitted a, a review I've been working on to the journal Ecology, where I reviewed all the studies in Australia on honeybee competition. And there's almost as many reviews and opinion pieces on honeybee competition as there are like actual data pieces. So there's a bit of an imbalance between what people think versus the actual um, empirical evidence. Um, but I recently published two papers and these are both these were chapters of my thesis, but they're now published papers, so um, anyone can read them. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a couple thousand dollars to make them open access, but you can email me and I will give them to you for free. Uh, so yeah, uh, academia sucks. Um, <laughs> so these two were published in the Biological Journal of the Linnaean Society and Austral Ecology, and one was um, on the um, interactions between European honeybees in urban areas and how this varies by various ecological factors and the impacts of honeybees on um, uh, pollination networks. And I did this over two years in residential gardens as well as bushland remnants. So we'll start off with their impacts on bee flower network properties in urban bushland remnants and residential gardens. Now, this is what um, these networks look like when you um, create a, a diagram of them. Um, and this is over uh, the entire 
um, <coughs> surveys, um, the first year and the second year. So honeybees are in red, and you can see that they dominated. Um, and these are the flowers, and they just swamped the flower resources. They also went more to the exotic plants than the native bees. So you can see they're very large components of these pollination networks. And they forage on more plant species, especially exotic plant species. Now, um, so I did you know, over two years in the first year, they were involved in 69.7% of interactions in bushland, 81.9% of interactions in gardens. So they especially dominated the residential gardens. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly in the second year, um, similar findings of being dominant in these networks, especially in gardens. So gardens are not so good habitats for our native bees, but um, honeybees I found were you know, resilient to habitat type. Now they were not replaceable with, with native bees. They had very different roles in these pollination networks. So the first one, normalized degree, it basically means how many plants they visit and they visited far more plant species than the native bees. So honeybees here, and you can see much higher than the native bee taxa. Now species strength, um, it's basically um, a metric that's co-determined by the specialization of other species in the network. And again, you can see that they were very distinct compared with the native bees. Um, and you know, the native bees, they all sort of, there were, weren't major significant differences between the taxa, but honeybees really stood out and they also had more variation. Um, now, another metric called interaction push-pull, it basically looking at whether the bees are more reliant on the plants or the plants are more reliant on the bees. Um, and honeybees, again, were very distinct compared with the native bees. So the native bees were more reliant on plants. Honeybees, because they're super generalist, they weren't so reliant. Um, and then the specificity, um, that's basically the variability in interactions. Honeybees were less specific, as you can see, and also there was a much greater range of um, their species specificity values because they visited so many different things. Now, they also were bas basically um, more important for the entire network because they visited um, more plants, the exotic plants. Um, and then there's this me uh, metric called um, D prime, which is basically a measure of specialization. It's not based on um, how specialized they are in terms of taxonomy of plants they visit. Um, but it's basically how random their visits are. And again, they were different from the native bees. So all this is showing that honeybees don't you know, integrate into these networks. They're actually quite distinct from our native bees. Now here's the really um, interesting and um, a bit shocking findings that they, the more honeybees there were, they actually had significant effects on the entire network properties and not good ones. So um, I found that they were, the more honeybees there were, the less connected networks were. And connectance is really important for the stability of these pollination networks. Um, I also found um, impacts on functional complementarity. Um, so more honeybees, greater functional complementarity. And this basically means that when there were more honeybees, the native bees had to divvy up resources more because honeybees were dominating the resources so they had to you know, basically try, try and partition resources to avoid competition. Um, I also found a greater niche overlap. So this means that there was more overlap between honeybees and native bees, which is again an index of competition. So they had significant impacts on um, competition. Um, so the way to connect us, connectance, they're less connected, which makes the networks more unstable. High functional complementarity, native bee taxa had to forage on different resources to reduce competition. Um, and so they might not be able to forage on their preferred hosts. Um, networks were more generalized because of the generalization of honeybees and there was more overlap. Um, so again, more competition. Now onto how honeybees affect native bees. 
this is specifically looking at their impact on the native bee assemblages. And I found that it's a very uh, nuanced um, topic and we can't just look at really coarse um, pictures. We have to look into the details. So in overall, I found that in terms of abundance, there was no association between honeybees and native bees and there was actually positive associations in residential gardens. And this means that in these residential gardens, which are actually poorer habitats, the things that positively influence honeybees also positively influence native bees. So things like um, a flowering, a, a mass blossoming carimbia, street tree, both honeybees and native bees love these. Um, so that's the positive associations there. Species richness. Um, it varied uh, according to the years. So on one year it was positive, on um, the next year it was negative, and again, the relationship varied by habitat type. So in the first year, positive relationship in residential gardens, not in bushland remnants. Second year, a significant negative relationship. And there's lots of noise here because ecology is super messy. Now here's a very interesting finding. So you probably hear Plant more flowers, more flower species, this will help bees. I actually found it didn't. Uh, what happened was when there were more flowers um, and more flower species, this is when the association between honeybees and native bees became negative. And this is because when people plant more flowers, it tends to be in gardens where you've got a high diversity of flowers, lots of these are exotics. Um, and so you're reducing the availability of floral resources for native bees and providing more resources for honeybees. And this is, you know, boosting honeybees at the expense of native bees. So giving them a competitive edge. So a very, um, you know, shocking, unexpected finding that sort of goes against conventional wisdom. Um, now, you know, these, these big pictures just between honeybees and overall abundance of native bees, Native bees are not a, a uniform group of bees. They differ a lot in their body size, their foraging specializations, um, and something that can mediate body size, uh, can mediate pollination um, interactions is body size. And so I looked at that. I divided the bees into small, medium, large, and I found that body size did have an influence. So smaller body bees were positively associated with honeybees, larger bees negatively associated. And this makes sense because smaller bees, they have lower resource requirements. So they don't need as much food and so they can coexist with honeybees. Larger bees though, they need more resources. So when there's honeybees taking these resources, they're the ones that are most vulnerable to competition. Now, I also found um, that taxa that had higher resource overlap with honeybees were at lower abundances. And again, this, this makes ecological sense and it's why very broad approaches just looking at overall bee abundance will miss the, the key details because if species forage on different things, then there's not going to be competition. Um, there's no, no chance for competition. But if they have the same floral preferences, this is when competition occurs. And I found that it did have negative impacts. Um, and especially in um, the, the bushland remnants. Uh, and it varied by taxa. Um, so as I mentioned, bees are um, phenotypically diverse. And so we, if we look at the different taxa, the ones that were most vulnerable to competition were the Hylaean bees. So here's a Hylaeus um, euxanthus, and lots of them love the Metaceae, so they're quite specialised, they're small to medium body size. And so honeybees love metaceae as well. And if they're both foraging on this, the, these native bees don't get a, a chance to go and forage on something else. Um, so they were um, the most vulnerable to competition. The least vulnerable were the amygdala. These are sometimes called blue banded bees. These are generalists as well. So they're all right. And the mega chili, I love the mega chili. Um, they're the ones on my, my jumper. And um, they love the fabaceae. And honeybees don't like fabaceae so much. And I think it's because if you look at a fabaceae flower, it's got this keel and to access the nectar and pollen, the bees have to like stick their head in. It requires more effort. Honeybees are a bit lazy. They can't be bothered doing that. Um, so they, they don't like those as much. They like more of the open flowers. 
Um, and so the, the mega chili were less impacted by competition. Now, uh, resource overlap was also much higher in residential gardens than bushland rents. And this is because residential gardens actually have more plant species than bushland remnants. But most of these plant species the native bees won't visit. So the few um, that are there are generally at lower abundances than the ones in bushland remnants. So competition is much more intense there. Now, basically I did find evidence that honeybees can compete with native bees. It's not going to be, you know, in every single context and that's not what we'd expect um, and you know if they were having very oops what happened there sorry um, they were having really serious impacts um, you know they've been here 200 years um, you know lots of native bees might not be here anymore we have no monitoring no baseline so they actually might have already caused the extinction of the very vulnerable bees which is not great but we can help reduce competitive impacts. Um, firstly, by making sure we promote native bees over honeybees, getting it right that honeybees, they have a role in the honey industry <coughs> and they have a role in crop pollination, but um, saving bees does not mean saving honeybees. And we have to you know, recognize that they're an introduced species and treat them as such. Um, we need to eradicate or prevent feral honeybee colonies because these ones, you know, they have numerous negative ecological effects and they're not great for beekeepers either because they can spread diseases and compete with the managed honeybees. Uh, and limit backyard beekeeping. So there's been this big push for backyard beekeeping, but it doesn't contribute to sustainability. Um, and it contributes a lot to the very large densities of feral honeybees and most backyard beekeepers don't do certification courses and because it's not like their livelihood doesn't depend on it, um, you know, they haven't been trained to prevent swarms and there's no real incentive to prevent swarms um, and, you know, there, there are feral colonies everywhere around Perth and it's really not good and, yeah, keeping bees in your backyard really doesn't doesn't do anything for the environment. Um, and it's much better, I think, to support beekeepers who have, you know, dedicated their life to keeping bees and support, you know, the industry and the economy. Um, and there should be mandatory swarm prevention courses for preventing honeybees from swarming. Um, on the other side of the equation, for native bees, we can make sure that they don't suffer from resource limitation by making sure our gardens have a very high proportion of bee-friendly flowers. Um, and I brought some of my books along today if anyone's interested in them, and I'll get onto talking about that soon, um, but so that there's enough food for the, the bees to coexist. Now, I've got a book called Creating a Haven for Native Bees, which has a list of some of the best flowers for our native bees in it. And I mentioned a couple of them during the talk, the, um, the tasty, like the carimbia and the eucalyptus and the melaleucas. Um, that's mega chili orifrons there on an eremophila, which is a great flower for native bees. And we can also help boost their populations with bee hotels so that the native bees have plenty of nesting resources um, so that they've got you know, larger populations. Um, and yeah, that's available as a physical book as well as an online book. Now we, as I mentioned, we need to promote our native bees and not honeybees. So I've got a, a red bubble store that has some artwork of it, of native bees, various designs, and I keep adding to it. Um, this one specifically is about promoting the native bees over the honeybees. And you can see we have a very diverse array of native bees. And in my maybe biased opinion, I think they're much um, cooler and they look more amazing. They've got like, you know, little cute faces and red fuzzy heads and, you know, blue bodies. Um, so they're, they're pretty cool. And um, in terms of, you know, some of the best flowers for native bees, this is the shirt, but it comes like red bubble. You can get it on like bath mats if you want a, a bath mat of <coughs> what flowers to plant for bees. Um, mugs, singlets, um, I've got um, a skirt that it's too cold to wear, but yeah, I have a skirt um, of the, the native bees. 
and then some of the other designs, you know, just raising awareness that we have more bees than honeybees because still so many people don't realize that we have native bees and how many we have here. And I mean, I was guilty of that. I, you know, before I came up with my PhD idea, I thought maybe there are like, I don't know, five species of bees. Um, there's even face masks. They're really trendy at the moment, especially if you're going to Sydney or Melbourne. Um, so yeah, um, this one says they don't sting, I bite. Uh, and um, that's our stingless bee. And then Netflix and Mega Chili. And I didn't come up with this idea. Um, so I'm very special to me did. So that's, I can't claim this one, but I really like the design. And then, you know, a couple more, like we want the bees to keep on making love, keep on making the babies and yeah, promoting our wild bees. And that's a double upside there. So I'm sorry about that. So yeah, um, that's my research on honeybee, native bee competition interactions. And um, there's still so much work to do, um, including on, um, I'd love to, I tried to do a little experiment removing feral colonies and then seeing the impact of native bees, but it's actually very hard to get councils to find colonies and remove them. So I only had four sites to do that and that's not a large enough sample size, but the, the results were suggestive. Um, when I removed feral honeybees, the numbers of feral numbers of honeybees overall that I saw were slightly less, and the numbers of native bees were slightly <coughs> more at my impact sites than my control sites. But again, four sites, there's not enough to do any sort of like real statistical power there. Um, but a lot of work still to do in this realm. Um, and a lot of work still to do is what native bees even occur here. So there's so many patches of bushland around here that have never been surveyed for the native bees. Um, Lake Claremont, I surveyed it for the first time, but it was only a limited season. And I've found, um, you know, big variation between years. Some species, I only find them in one particular year. And a really amazing finding from my surveys that I've been done, done um, you know, throughout Perth, also in the Jarrah Forest recently, is that almost every site that I survey, there's only, there's bees there that I only find there. So we have like an amazing diversity, but also very, very localized. And I feel like there's a, a big opportunity here to maybe have like a, a, like a council bee, like for each sort of local council, have a bee that represents it or something. Um, yeah, just raising awareness about our native bees. Um, but I do um, talks and if you're interested in designing your garden better for our native bees, I can help consult on that. Um, when it's bee weather, which is not now, I do bee walks, um, school incursions, and um, I love my, my native bee photography. So if you're interested in sort of like multimedia, um, I can supply that. And these are, these are my favorite bees. They're actually active at the moment, but not here. They occur um, very localized, again, in the Midwest, in the Gascoigne, Carnarvon region. Um, this is Amagilla dorsoni. Um, when I give talks in schools, they're like, oh, cute, just giving him a piggyback. Um, <laughs> yeah, a really fun one, actually. Um, but that's the female and that's the male, um, really cool bees. And yeah, bee hotels, if you put them up in your garden, you'll have the little native bees visiting. So there's actually a lot of ways that everyone can help our native bees. Um, but yeah, like promoting the native bees um, and, and being very, very transparent about um, that honeybees, they can have negative impacts. So yeah, this, this call to make everyone a beekeeper is actually quite detrimental to saving bees overall. So thank you everyone for um, listening to my research and buzz about bees. And if you have any questions, I'm um, happy to, to answer them. Yeah. 
Yeah, so when in the residential gardens, there's lots of exotic plants that few native bees can forage on. And so of the, the resources that are there, there's not enough to sustain the native bee populations. Honeybees, though, do really well on a diversity of flower resources, including the exotics. Um, so they're doing great. The native bees, not so well. So if we instead have gardens that are dominated by um, lots of bee-friendly native flora, then this will be a lot, a lot better for the native bees. Yeah. Um, oh, you were saying or suggesting that the professional beekeepers are better, or well, I understand it, that they're better at managing the relationship between honeybees and native bees? Mm, from, so I guess it, it, it would depend on the particular beekeeper, but the ones that um, like are you know, super professional that I've you know, talked to, they actually understand um, that, I guess because they, they know the bees so well, they understand that honeybees can dominate resources. Um, and they also, they're so invested in their honeybees that they don't want the bees to swarm. Um, so they make sure that their honeybees don't go feral because it would be very bad for their business. Whereas backyard beekeepers, they haven't, you know, done certification courses. I mean, some have, but there's no, there's no requirement. Um, and, you know, the, if their, their bees swarm, it's like, oh, well, there's a you know, small loss rather than the, there's my, you know, my income loss. Yeah. So they could be key to keeping the balance between honeybees and uh, because they're here, mm. here yeah. and, uh, and the native bees. So they're, they're, they're important rather than the, the, the urban. Yeah. Encouragement. Yeah. And, you know, as I said, um, like the honeybee industry is important and for crop pollination service, that, that's where honeybees should be, not in urban areas, not in natural areas, but in, in crop areas where, you know, to be honest, native bees will never be able to replace honeybees as crop pollinators, unless it's things like tomatoes that honeybees can't pollinate. But yeah, that's they do have a role. But um, this idea that you know they're sort of like saviors of the environment, like the, the honeybee is held up as as a symbol of the environment, is actually not very true. Yeah. I'm interested in the sex life of the honeybees. Because, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. There's, there's only one queen. Yeah. How many males are? Um, lots. So what happens is she, <laughs> she, she goes on what's called a nuptial flight um, and when she's a virgin and she, she flies and all the, the she has, like, she emits her pheromones and all these drones come and mate with her and then she basically stores their sperm for years and there's um, sperm competition um, happening and also some, like, female um, cryptic mate choice and so... Even within a honeybee colony, they're not all perfectly related because she will use the sperm of some males to fertilise the eggs and sp sperm of some other males. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's how it happens. So the males don't forage for food? Then. No, they don't even... Like, the honeybee males don't even forage for food. Like, they sit in the hive and get fed. But male native bees do, yeah. <laughs> And if, if, I mean, if you're interested in the sex lives of bees, I have video footage of Amigal Gossam. <laughs> <laughs> Slow motion. <laughs> yep. So the, the problem is with the introduced European honeybee. So presumably the problem is in all areas where the European honeybee can spread out, mm. which is related to our agricultural areas in Mediterranean and, uh, well, subtropical, not in the tropical areas. No, yeah, I, so, I don't find them there. Yeah. Right, so it's, it's in the more southern regions of Australia where the problem exists. Yeah, yeah. Where we're growing introduced crops from the Mediterranean mm. and Europe. Not necessarily. So they do really well in bushland. Um, and I've done surveys in the Helena Aurora Ranges, which is like eight hours from Perth. Um, no crops, like ages from, it's like middle of nowhere. So many honeybees. Um, and you know, the, the reason why they don't care up north is because um, it's too hot and humid for them rather than um, 
I mean, they do occur up north, um, like in Broome, but when you go even further out, like I was recently in um, Walyarda, which is like, yeah, very, very out back, and there were no honeybees there. Um, but in like central Broome, when people have their, their gardens that they plant with exotics and water them. But yeah, honeybees are much denser in, you know, I guess the cooler regions, and they also need water sources. So in des the desert regions, you won't find honeybees, but you'll find native bees. Yeah. Mm. Well. <laughs> Here's something I prepared earlier. <laughs> Um, so I've got um, yeah, this book, Creating a Haven for Native Bees, and it's got a um, whole list of plants that are available. Um, so they, I've made sure they're available. You can get them from Xanthoria Nursery, um, as well as a section on these plants. But like the Matasi are ones that are loved by honeybees and native bees, but then there's things like Dianella, which is buzz pollinated, um, and the honeybees, they can't buzz pollinate, so that's a really good one. Um, and as I mentioned, some of the Fabaceae, they also um, aren't too keen on, um, they quite like the Dubesia, but they're not so keen on the Jacksonia, I've noticed. So that's another great one as well. Uh, the Hibertia, native bees love it, honeybees will forage on it, but not as much. Um, so there, yeah, there's definitely um, plants that you can plant that will definitely be really attractive to native bees. Yeah. How much is the book? Um, $30 for the physical copy, $18 for an online e-copy. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Yeah, so the bee hotels, the bees are at the moment, it's cold and it's rainy and it's winter, so most of them are dead, um, but they're, they're, the population is alive as the larvae. I recommend putting them up in September and um, the, native, the peak time I found for native bees to use them is about December. Um, now, whether they, if you put them close to a honeybee colony, um, they'll be reduced occupancy. It's a really interesting question that I think deserves further research, and I would love to research that. I've got a half-finished paper on not basic, not the proximity to a honeybee colony, but the abundance of honeybees in relation to nesting success of native bees. And I did find that when there were more honeybees, fewer nest cells were produced, and it's a, like one of my 20 papers that I really need to finish. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, whether having a honeybee colony, like I did, at some of my sites there were colonies, um, and bee hotels were definitely still used. So they will be used. Um, there might be lower reproductive output, but um, you know, if you didn't have the bee hotels there, they'll probably be even lower reproductive output than that. So they're you know, definitely something that are good to put up, provided you don't buy Mr. Fothergill's ones, which are bad. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Fothergill's, it's a brand that um, Bunnings sells and yeah. um, they're not designed very well. The holes are too big, they're too short. Mm -hmm. um, they're from imported wood. Mm -hmm. The holes are drilled with like splinters and there's like cavities that just lead into empty spaces, so not not well designed one. But it's really easy to make these. I've got some like instructional videos on how to make them. Um, you just get PVC pipe and bamboo or wooden block and drill holes in them. So it's not not too difficult. Yeah, or just like just a tree and drill holes in it, like carefully, carefully. Yes, yeah. If you want spiders and wasps, then get those ones. Yes. 
I'd say no, um, especially during drought years. Um, if we're having an amazing flowering season, it'd probably be okay. But I think sure, there should be some regulation at least rather than just, you know, everyone can go there and put as many hives as they want. There should be a regulation on the density and accordance to the foraging resources. And even the head of the CRC um, for honeybee products agrees with that. Um, that, you know, it should be a regulated industry according to resource levels rather than just putting them all in there. Yeah. Is there much competition between native bees and honey eaters? Um, so that's never been studied, but based on my observations of the types of flowers that um, the native bees forage on and the honey eaters, no, but I have definitely noticed um, between uh, honey eaters and um, honey bees. For example, the honey bees will forage on kangaroo paws, which are bird adapted. Native bees don't forage on them, but um, honey bees do. Lots, like honey bees love grevillea. Um, and an interesting thing I found is that I've never, well, I very rarely see native bees foraging on grevillea in urban areas, but when I go further out into more bushland, I do find it, and I don't know whether that's because um, it's the type of grevilleas that people plant, you know, the hybrids, or whether it's because the honey eaters um, deplete the resources or the honeybees deplete the resources. So another topic I would love to investigate. Yeah. Many, many unknowns, many research questions. Yes? Basic question. How do you actually count the honeybee the bee colonies and how many there are? I just don't know how you... Oh, the colonies. Um, it's very hard to find the colonies. Another research thing that I would love to do is like to train sniffer dogs to find honeybee colonies. I think that would be super, like it's definitely achievable. Um, you know, they, they've, I've gone to ecology conferences where they've trained dogs to be able to locate trees where koalas with chlamydia are. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure they'd be able to find honeybee colonies and that would definitely help understand the density. Um, you're, you're counting your number of bees in mm. locations by the colonies? Or? Um, by numbers of bees. So I will bees, look at a plant and count how many bees are foraging on it, say in five minutes, mm -hmm. and how many native bees are, and then go to another plant. Oh, I see. So you, you observe a plant and you watch that plant and you count the number of bees. And then you've got your bee interesting your those diagrams. Things coming down, that must translate to your diagrams. Yeah, like how many um, how many species there are, and each um, basically I did in total during my PhD fourteen sites, ten months of so one hundred and forty surveys. So there would be one hundred and forty data points. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for that wonderful talk. You must have put an enormous amount of work into that. Uh, yes. Quite a long time. <laughs> the question is, you, you said at the beginning that the talk of an apocalypse is misplaced, mm. certainly in terms of Western Australia. But what about the rest of the world, where they're still talking about tremendous declines in bee numbers? So worldwide, um, globally, honeybee colonies are increasing. There have been losses um, in... Europe and North America from mainly varroa mite and deformed wing virus, but it's very easy for beekeepers to, when they have colony losses, to get new colonies and split them. Um, so globally, colonies are, are increasing and it's, um, they're definitely not at any risk of going extinct anytime soon. Native bees though, in Australia, pretty much none are being monitored, but we do know that some are only being collected like one or two times. 30 years ago or something. Um, so definitely signs that they are not doing well. There's quite a few listed bee species overseas, um, lots of bombus, bumblebee species, um, and honeybees have been implicated in declines of some of them, you know, competition. Uh, but yeah, we, I'm, I'm part of a, a group looking at listing species in Australia on the IUCN red list, unfortunately, lots of our species that we looked at 
we couldn't list them because they're basically data deficient. Um, so yeah, just not enough research, but there are some that are definitely candidates for listing. Um, but yeah, so bees are declining, um, but honeybees are not still not the ones that we need to be worrying about. Like there have been colony losses, but um, from an, an extinction point of view, they're, they're all right. Yeah. Yes? I guess part of the problem here when you talk about gardens and providing uh, plants for native bees is that we're so committed to the European garden mm. and so on. And uh, in a hot country, we like the greenery that comes from the European style gardens. Um, when I was in, when I go to Melbourne, one of the things that I really love to do is go to the Australian Botanical Gardens. You've probably been there, I imagine. In, I don't uh, think so, Canberra, actually. Outside Melbourne. It's I a, haven't, but I would uh, like to. <laughs> it's a fabulous garden. So there's the Botanical Gardens right in central Melbourne, which have got exotic species in them. And then there's an Australian botanical garden out in Cranbourne, I'm pretty sure that's where it is. Somewhere. Yeah. Hmm? That's Cranbourne. Cranbourne, yeah. And, um, and what has amazed me when I go there, they show you how to create, or how to create gardens using Australian species, and how to create lush gardens using Australian species, which I think is fabulous because it gives you options to plant natives and, and create fabulous greenery and all sorts of things. Um, but I wondered if you, if anyone's working with the Australian Botanical Gardens to work out what, speci what species to plant to attract native bees and then to educate people on how they too can have their luxurious green garden but have lots of plants for Australian not that I know of, but I mean, I know what plants are good for bees. Um, and um, I've actually been working with City of Bustleton and they're creating like a big uh, pollinator corridor mm -hmm. and planting plants based on my recommendations along there and also based on, because you know, like the bees, I think again from this mismatch between Australia versus Northern Hemisphere, they love their mixed, lots of mixes of lots of different things. Mm -hmm. But from a foraging perspective, mm -hmm. um, it's easier to locate a big patch of things. Mm -hmm. So big patches of bee friendly flowers mm -hmm. um, rather than a scattered mix of one, of one thing. Like that's just not enough resources and not en enough of a cue really for bees. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've been doing a little bit of work for that and I've done, I've done like surveys for the councils and stuff. I have a list of the, the plants that the bees are visiting and city of Bayswater is like using it to plan their like plantings. And so yeah, there's, there's a bit of work being done. Because the honeybees have captured people's attention, mm. including mine, so I'm, this talk is very good for me, <laughs> educating me. <laughs> and, uh, and I know in, in places like Melbourne and other eastern states, cities, they've got honeybees, you know, you know beehives, tops of buildings mm. in the city yeah. and all through the suburbs and everyone's encouraged to get their um, beehive. And, um, Start, another, start a beehive, you know, yeah. lots of amateurs, including me. <laughs> I've got a beehive. It's all right. <laughs> You're forgiven. Look, that's a really good question. Um, I've, I've been a gardener in Dalkeith and Western Suburbs for 30 years, and um, we do have a tendency towards those very lush, very European style gardens. And, um, but it's, it's not difficult to incorporate natives into mm. your garden. Mm -hmm. um, just as an example, my front garden, Kit knows my front mm -hmm. garden, I have native bees nesting in the ground. I the dug garden. up his front garden. And we dug up the front garden. <laughs> <laughs> Check out his nest. But I have, I have azaleas and I have clivias, clivias, depending on how you pronounce it. But I also have 14 or 15 species of natives in there. Mm -hmm. And there's a pond and a bird bath mm -hmm. and an exotic tree. And mm -hmm. 
Um, you can mix the two successfully. Mm. There's kangaroo paws, Hardensburg here, and Dianella. The kangaroo paws attract the honeybees. Sure, but the, so they attract, like but they attract the native, the, the native so birds. Native birds yeah. to my garden, which is lovely. And so you can have a mix. I think yeah. um, there's been a like a a, a real bonanza of uh, backyard beekeeping, mm. and I think mm. part of the reason why we're having this conversation mm. tonight is because it is a largely unregulated backyard beekeeping. Yeah. Mm. Every council's got different rules about it. Mm. Some councils have no rules. Mm. Um, if your neighbours are okay with it, you can go for it. Mm. And so, um, and, and some of those beekeepers will undertake the necessary training to understand mm. how to care for their bees. Mm. And uh, others are just really having a crack and um, you know, they lose interest or they find it's actually quite complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have their hive swarm and those are the hives that end up. Yeah, Claremont and other nature reserves around the place. Yeah. You know, as I said last summer, we had a plethora of um, feral hives, mm. and uh, and that causes direct competition for our 40 yeah. plus species of natives. Mm. Um, and, and I think some native plants require those specialist native bees for mm. pollination. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So like mm -hmm. bush tomatoes, um, the dianella, mm -hmm. honeybees can't pollinate them. So. So if you were out competing your native bees that those plants rely on, mm -hmm. native bees for pollination services, then you really are having a fairly major impact on the ecology. Right? Mm. Yes. So is that an encouragement to grow more bush foods in our garden? Yeah. So that'll attract the native bees. Yeah, it's um, a very like increasing um, niche industry like the Australian finger limes and the bush tomatoes. Are they pollinated by native bees? bees. Yeah. Um, so there's not been the, necess the necessary studies for the Australian finger limes, but I've seen mega chili bees visit them. Oh. Um, yeah. So we'll see. I was thinking of planting some. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think there are lots of great natives in your garden. Yeah. Water-wise. Yeah, like councils are very onto the water-wise thing. Yeah. So. Low fertilizers, especially in the catchment area that surrounds a wetland. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for the talk. Oh, thank you. Thanks. 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 Um, my question is, well, I live in an area where, which is fairly open. We sometimes have bees come and make swarms, mm. and they stay there for a couple of weeks, and then they seem to move on. What's the best thing to do about that to, uh, I mean, to get rid of the spooks? Um, so probably contact the um, WA APRIS Society because it's basically, it's, so it's very hard to remove a colony once it's established in a hollow. Um, it's when they're swarming is the perfect time for the APRIS, they get a free colony. So if you see one, a swarm, um, then contact the WA APRIS Society and usually there's a beekeeper um, that will be quite keen to get that swarm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any more right. questions? One there? Yes. Um, so, would you encourage people to take up, rather than taking up a kind of hobby hive, rather than take up a bee hotel and spread bee hotels around the garden? Very much yeah. so, yes. I like the way you think. <laughs> for sure. And we've had Scotch students making bee hotels down at Lake Claremont with the year 10s. We ran a workshop with Kit um, and the information. You could, Kit's got a wonderful Facebook page too, Bees in the Burbs. Um, lots of great photography, lots of great tips. We got any more questions? Okay. okay. Thanks everyone. Good. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Kit. Dr. Kit. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, um, next month's night chat is a complete history. <laughs> Our speaker, Dr. Uh, Professor Barrett from DBCA, who uh, handles all queen relocations in Perth, um, was set to speak in August, but he's having some surgery, so he's 
are going to be speaking in September, uh, and I am scrambling to find a certain for all this. So um, I hope to update you on that soon. Um, if uh, we'll, we'll announce that um, via Facebook and the usual channels, and there'll be an article in the post um, about two weeks before the. Uh, for the event. It will be on the same fourth Tuesday of every month. Um, um, and then Jeff Barrett talking Quinders after that. We're hoping to have Quinders relocated in the park here at some stage. Um, so that would be quite exciting. And uh, Heidi, did you, you wanted to say something? Um, this is Heidi Hardesty, our <coughs> previous coordinator and general leader. <coughs> Around yes, and involved in too many things. Mm. One of them is now the Nanas for Native Forests and also the WA Forest Alliance. So right now, if you know anything about our native forests, they are in peril. And WA Forest Alliance thinks they are not being managed properly. For the first time ever, um, the government isn't has put out a public survey so that people can have their input into how we go forward with our native forests. For those of you who don't know, there is an existing forest management plan and that is reviewed every 10 years. So this survey is designed before this forest management plan is renewed and you can actually go and have your say on how you want your hot, the southern forests to be used. Um, you actually have an opportunity now, and there's a, a specific questions about, um, do you want beekeeping there? And perhaps we should, you can go in there and put your comments that, yeah, beekeeping may be welcome, but if it's highly regulated. So our, our native forests, for those of you who don't know, people think, oh, aren't our native forests saved? Way back in 2002, the Labour government um, put a moratorium on clearing our old growth forests, which is now less than 10% and, pro and probably less than 9% um, of our original forests are left that could be classified as old growth forests. The problem with that classification is they keep tweaking it so that they keep eroding it away. And we are actually still logging our state native forests. And sometimes uh, in a logging coop, we are logging them less than 100 years. So we're going around and logging them. That sounds like a long time, but it takes actually over 200 years for a hollow to form big enough for our black cockatoos to nest in, for example. So there's a lot of problems with our uh, management of our native forests, including that it's not profitable. Um, our tax dollars are actually subsidizing the industry. Um, most of our magnificent jaras and um, maris are being sold off for firewood and wood chips, not even for high quality oh. furniture. There's a lot in it. So and I've, I've put around these little uh, pamphlets. If you look on the back, you, you can see the green space that was forested in 1829. There's a little bit of it left in the southwest of WA, but if you look at what's left, not much of it is actually in conservation areas which is even more frightening. And this is the reason why we are a biodiversity hotspot. A hotspot is actually a badge of shame because it means, firstly, that we have so much biodiversity, so many plants and animals that are found nowhere else on the planet, that it is a very special and unique place. But it's a hot spot because over 70%, and probably now over three quarters of it, have already been cleared. And the scientists are telling us it's time to stop and save what we have left. So, this is your chance to actually go on to the um, um, WA state government's website 
and fill in this survey. It takes about 20 minutes or so if you, if you really want to do it. Um, there are, it, is, it isn't all that straightforward. If you're passionate about the environment, you'll probably find it is. But the WA uh, Forest Alliance has re received a lot of requests on guidance on how to fill it in if you're really concerned about saving our, our, our native forests. And they're not against logging per se. They want to see a transition to logging only um, plantations and not dam you're not converting any state forests into plantations. <laughs> and so they've created this guideline. You can find it online, or I've put a few pamphlets out there as well. So if you, it's really it's the first time that the any subsequent government has ever invited the public to comment on the forest management plan or the future of our forests. So please, um, it's your chance. Thank you. Honey. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks, kids. That was good. That was exciting.